It is not an overstatement to call the Great Lakes, each one individually and all of them together, wonders to behold and an unparalleled resource that constitute an astonishing 20% of the Earth's surface fresh water. But half a century ago, they faced a clear and present danger from pollution and environmental degradation. Enter the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, signed on April 15, 1972. With us now on how that ushered in a new era in Canada-U.S. oversight of the lakes, we welcome, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Kelsey Leonard, Canada Research Chair and Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo and a member of the International Joint Commission's Great Lakes Water Quality Board. In the nation's capital, another member of the IJC's Great Lakes Water Quality Board, there's Mark Fisher, who is President and CEO of the Council of the Great Lakes Region, which TVO is proud to partner with over the coming months on issues involving the lakes and this anniversary. And in Mississauga, Ontario, Gail Kranzberg, Professor of Engineering and Public Policy at McMaster University and a former Director of the Great Lakes Regional Office of the IJC. And it's great to have you three back on TVO for this important anniversary. Let's just, uh, before we start our conversation, get some facts and background on the record here to get us started because the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between Canada and the United States was first signed April 15, 1972, identifies shared priorities and actions needed to restore and protect the Great Lakes. It commits both countries to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the waters of the Great Lakes. The agreement was updated in 1978, 1987, and 2012, and if we want to get in our little time machine here, let's take a look at Prime Minister Trudeau, no, not this one, his dad, and President Richard Nixon at the signing ceremony. A marked change of mood inside for the signing of the Great Lakes Cleanup Agreement in the Chandelier Confederation Room on Parliament Hill. It culminates eight years of effort to reverse the trend to slow death in some of the lakes. Today, it's predicted that in five years, people will once more swim in the now-polluted areas of Lakes Ontario and Erie, and trout will abound again. Symbolically, the lakes have been a grim reminder of all the terrible things that have been happening to the North American environment. So the signing, for symbolic reasons and much more, was hailed here as a milestone in the world battle against pollution. Gail, to you first, how groundbreaking was that moment? Oh, enormously. Um, um, the two nations at that point in time were not necessarily uh, particularly amicable with each other. And yet, um, the dangers posed to the Great Lakes from the turn of the 19th century into the mid-20th century made it impractical to ignore it. Um, you know, we, we, we dumped all sorts of chemicals and sewage into the Great Lakes because they're so vast, we thought that it wouldn't do any harm. And yet, we had so much waste, sewage waste, untreated waste, partially treated waste, that we had plant growth, algal growth was that was so enormous in Lake Erie, it was choking the lake. Um, a little biology, when the algae decompose, they actually rob the bacteria, use up oxygen in the water. And so in the 60s, there was a big media declaration that Lake Erie was dead because of massive fish kills. Well, the lake wasn't dead, a lot of the fish were dead. and as a consequence, with enough pressure from the environmental movement that was actually born in the 1960s from Rachel Carson's famous Silent Spring, mm -hmm. the governments of the day started paying great attention to environmental pollution and damage. And interestingly, when Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau signed the agreement, I want to quote something that he said at the time. He said that the agreement is a pro it promises to restore to a wholesome condition, an immense area which through greed and indifference has been permitted to deteriorate disgracefully. And to have that kind of language coming from our prime minister and agreed to by the president of the United States was truly astonishing. And the evolution of that agreement over time from the phosphorus problems of, of that period of that era to persistent toxic substances to Great Lakes geographic locations called areas of concern and now with climate change and invasive species. It's just a call to action. It still remains a promise, but to have the two na na national leaders make a promise to bring back to wholesomeness, this vast potential beauty 
was really, truly remarkable. Well, Mark, maybe I can get you to follow up on that in this regard. And Gail referred to the fact that the two leaders of the two countries were not getting along particularly well. Uh, note to the control room, I'm going to quote what Richard Nixon called Pierre Trudeau back then. <laughs> so have the beeping machine standing by. He referred to him on the tapes that were later discovered in the uh, Nixon White House office as that asshole. So <laughs> for those two gentlemen to have signed this deal, again, Mark, in your judgment, how big a deal? It was a big deal. Uh, and we have to remember that this collaboration, this partnership actually started back with the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909, uh, which was then signed between the United States and Great Britain on behalf of Canada. And under Article 4, there's a clause that says, thou shall not pollute boundary waters to the inju injury of health or property on the other side. And over that period of time, between 1909 and the 60s, there were a number of studies actually that were undertaken and look at the, the health of various aspects of the Great Lakes. But the seminal work uh, referenced by the International Joint Commission that was done in 1964 at the request of both countries looked at a lot of the issues that Gail has highlighted for us. So nutrients and uh, potentials of oil spills, radioactivity because of uh, nuclear testing and the increase in nuclear power in the Great Lakes region. Uh, there were a number of issues that were concerning both parties at the time. And uh, it's that reference and the recommendations from the IJC that asked the parties to put in place remedial action plans, significant plans, um, you know, really led to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in 1972. Kelsey, as you look back 50 years later, how much of that deal back then stands up today? Well, these types of international agreements are very much also about the way in which we enforce. It's about implementation. Uh, words on a page are only go so far. And so when I look back at the agreement in, in 1972, the big gaping omission is the fact that Indigenous nations, First Nations, Tribal Nations, and Métis peoples who have been uh, the stewards of this portion of the Great Lakes and region of the world for millennia were not signatories to the agreement. Um, even in the context uh, that was mentioned earlier of the 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty, they also were not signatories to that treaty. So sometimes the 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty and the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, although very seminal in the context of U.S. and Canadian political development in the context of water governance, are seen as these sort of first beacons of international, binational coordination. They actually aren't the first. The first are the treaties and agreements that the Crown, Canada, and the United States signed with Indigenous nations in the region. And so I call those the first transboundary water treaties. And so when we look back and we even start to reconcile at 50 years how well have we been doing, it largely comes back to that question of enforcement and implementation. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, the 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty, the treaties with Indigenous nations, are only as good as we, as citizens, make them through our enforcement and responsibility ethic towards their implementation. Now, Mark, that is an omission that took place 50 years ago. And I guess you could argue they didn't know any better back then to, to include Indigenous groups, which one hopes they would today. Is that a mistake that can be fixed today? It absolutely can be fixed, and it needs to be fixed. I think, as Kelsey rightly pointed out, uh, when we look at the the history of our Indigenous peoples in this in this region in North America, they in fact had their own covenants well before the 1972 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, the Dish with One Spoon. Uh, these are sacred waters for 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 many people, and it is a glaring omission. And I think if we are looking to update the agreement going forward. We absolutely need to find a way of including, uh, including First Nations, Métis, and tribes uh, in that framework agreement. They are, they are an important uh, uh, party and partner that needs to be involved in any agreement going forward, in my view. All right. Having said that, we do know that it was Canada and the United States 50 years ago that made this agreement. And, Gail, on balance, would you say 50 years later that each side has held up its end of the agreement? And how well have they? Well... <laughs> Pierre Trudeau said it was a promise, and it's nothing more than a promise, to Kelsey's point. It's words on a page. Um, there have been some really good things that have happened. I mean, we all know that there's been a fact that for a long time, phosphorus has been banned from laundry detergents. That happened because of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Most people don't recognize that. That major policy shift in reducing phosphorus loads to our lakes was a consequence of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So there's a definite plus. 
But there's a lot of things that have not worked well um, or have a, I'd say more of a patchy outcome, like the remedial action plans that Mark just mentioned a moment ago for these Great Lakes areas concern. You know, these were invented in 1987, actually the concept was 1985. So 35 plus years later, of the 43 locations, nine, nine have been declared restored to a healthy system. So it's a long way to go. not great progress, but that's, that's been accelerated only in recent years because of a U.S., a renewed U.S. commitment to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative under the Obama, Obama, uh, Barack Obama's administration that was renewed again under Trump, renewed presently now under, Doc, uh, under President Biden. That's infusing a lot of money to correct and, re and, and repair and remediate. What we're not really good at is preventing and, and protecting the excellence that's there. So this is a, I, I sense that we're in a catch up mode. We're catching up and, and a good example of catching up is, is back in 1971 when Dr. Seuss wrote the Lorax, which was industrial irresponsible use of land and dumping into lakes and chasing the fish out to find waters that are not so stinky and slimy, just like Lake Erie, which he put in his book originally, well, some 10 years later, that line came out because Lake Erie had actually recovered well from nutrient, um, nutrient uh, inputs. What we're good at doing is where engineers can solve a problem at the end of a pipe. What we're not good at doing is collective responsibility, to Kelsey's point, on stewardship, on ownership. And that's been a failing. The 2012 protocol started to address that by being very, by in, in including that all of this that Canada and the United States are intending to do would be in collaboration with First Nations, Métis, tribes, municipalities, um, provinces, states, and others. And that's a good step forward towards a better governance system. But we still got knocking at the door in Chicago, Asian carp ready to come into the lakes and destroy our fishery. Well, let's a, let's hold off on that because I want to get. I want to get to some of the wins first. Let's look. We'll, we'll talk about some of the challenges still to come. But Kelsey, there have been wins over the last 50 years. What's the biggest win in your opinion? Well, I think the biggest win in my opinion, again, connected to the recognition of Indigenous sovereignty in the region, is largely with the recommitments in 2012. In 2012, we saw the addition to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement of designated representative roles for tribes, First Nations, and Métis leadership to have a, a seat within the water quality uh, agreement advisory boards, including like the one that I sit on, the Great Lakes Water Quality Advisory Board, as well as the Science Advisory Boards. And so that is something that has also lent itself to those 2012 recommitments, where we also saw the integration of traditional ecological knowledge being a listed area for the agreement to include in its science-based approaches to management of the lakes. And so now we see in 2022, the IPCC reports recognizing the, found, the foundational worth of indigenous knowledge to addressing our climate crisis. We see the United States and the White House coming out with guidance on all federal agencies utilizing indigenous traditional ecological knowledge in their work and in the way in which they think about science and science-based decision-making. And so I kind of think that that 2012 recommitment was largely very instrumental in beckoning in a shift that we are seeing towards valuing indigenous science and knowledge. And that wasn't necessarily done by uh, the sort of good nature altruism of the U.S. And, and Canadian governments. It was led by Indigenous leaders who, despite not being signatories to the 1972 agreement, have never abrogated their stewardship and conservation practices towards the lakes. They have maintained really robust scientific enterprises and restoration efforts throughout the lake region. And a lot of what we see in terms of healthy ecosystems across the lakes are a testament to those Indigenous nation activities and, and science-based-led efforts. So I think that was really um, a highlight and, and an area where we're going to continue to see future growth. Okay, good to have that on the record. Mark, how about you? In your view, 50 years of wins, what would uh, top your list? Well, I think back to some of the points that uh, Gail had raised earlier. Um, 
you know, we you know, we had a nutrient problem uh, related to phosphorus. In many ways, we've we have fixed it. Um, there are a number of different uh, toxic hotspots where I think we've been making a concerted effort and, and cleaning up and, and restoring those areas. I think we've done a much better job at controlling, let's say, sewage contamination going into the Great Lakes from uh, outdated wastewater systems. But as we look at those problems, they're old problems, but they're also become new problems. So if you look at nutrients in the Great Lakes, obviously we're dealing with that from a farming standpoint. Uh, when you look at our wastewater treatment systems, yes, we fixed uh, sewage flowing into the Great Lakes by and large, but we're also seeing new challenges in terms of treatment issues, whether it's pharmaceuticals or other contaminants that are able to get through our wastewater systems. And so some of our past wins are also becoming new challenges as well as these issues evolve over time. Well, let's pick up on new challenges. Uh, Gail just talked about the Asian carp problem uh, that we've done programs on here before. Gail, you've been on talking about that. The remediation efforts uh, have been running behind schedule. Um, what would you like to add to that list, Mark, in terms of things that ought to be working better by this point but aren't? Well, you know, funding is a big issue. I think Gail has rightly addressed the fact that the United States, through its Great Lakes Restoration Initiative over the last decade plus, has spent um, well in excess of $3 billion in cleaning up and accelerating uh, restoration and identifying real issues and tackling real issues like climate change and invasive species and what have you. They're spending now roughly $500 million a year between Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, the new infrastructure bill, you know, Canada, unfortunately, through its Freshwater Action Plan, which just sunsetted on March 31st, was spending $75 million for the entirety of the country for freshwater protection, $9 million annually just for the Great Lakes. So we are being eclipsed by the United States when it comes to funding and our focus on some of these priorities. Really disappointed that the budget last week did not address any of these issues in a meaningful way. There was some investment in, for example, organizations like the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, which is great. But that investment is actually paying back a past debt that Canada owed to the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission because it never paid its dues to the organization. So it's great that some of these issues are being corrected, but Canada needs to be really stepping up in a much more meaningful way to invest in restoration and to be investing in Great Lakes science because it is being eclipsed right now by its, uh, by its partner to the south. Kelsey, what would you add to that list? Well, right now what we're seeing as well uh, being considered in Parliament is an environmental racism bill. And that bill really needs to be passed because it has real implications for the ability to implement the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and to the restoration of areas of concern, along with the remedial action plans that were mentioned earlier. More, a majority of First Nations, Tribal Nations and Métis communities live within 10 kilometres of an area of concern. So their traditional territories and waters that surround and are inclusive of the Great Lakes have been highly degraded, not only for human beneficial uses, which is largely how we determine whether or not an area has been highly toxic uh, or then listed as an area of concern, but also for the health and ecosystem itself, right? The health of the lake, the health of the ecosystem itself. We need to move beyond in our current way in which we address the climate crisis to one, ensure that human beings, yes, have their rights met in terms of addressing environmental racism and not being unduly disproportionately burdened by toxic environments. But we also need to ensure that for nature itself. And what we're seeing right now is, is largely the exact opposite, because the types of standards we put in place, like beneficial use impairments, are based on human beneficial uses, not on the natural world uses of those ecosystems. Hmm. Okay, Gail, what gets added to your list? Well, I want, I want to just address something slightly slightly different from what Kelsey said in that I think half of the beneficial ways that the lakes can be used to the benefit are for the benefit of people, swimming, drinking, fishing, eating, but also to the benefit of, of fish and wildlife. They should be free of tumors. They should have habitat. They should have um, thriving natural populations and, and communities. So. That's just a, a, a piece there that I think that is, is a complicated piece, but I think is an interesting one. Um, it, it seems to me that what we really are looking towards, for example, is to Mark's point, the science in the Great Lakes has really fallen back between, as compared to the science, ocean science. The IJC right now through the Science Advisory Board that I, I, I co-chair with, with my American counterpart, we put together what we think is a decadal science strategy 
what kind of vessels, what kind of equipment do we need to really measure what's going on in the lakes? Because if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And, if, and, and this is about a thriving economy. Mark can speak volumes on the value, the economic value of the Great Lakes region. If it were a nation state, it would be one of the largest in the world. You can't manage that economy if you can't protect that environmental asset that you have. And the science needed to do that has fallen way behind. The other thing I think that I, uh, I would emphasize is what Mark just said a moment ago. We're investing 8 million a year. The US is investing 400, 500 million a year. There's something very wrong there. There was a consortium that went after Environment and Climate Change Canada as the lead saying, here's, a strat here's, here's, a, here's the strategy for the next 10 years, $100 million a year to make sure our beaches are open, to make sure we deal with persistent toxic substances, to make sure that our communities become more resilient to a changing climate, harmful algal blooms that we're seeing now in Lake Ontario, we're even seeing algae problems in Lake Superior, which you've never seen before. So the science is very complicated. The climate specter over everything tends to exacerbate what we knew about the lakes. And in fact, in the late, in the 2006 or so, a bunch of Great Lakes scientists said, the lakes are at a tipping point. We can't predict where they're going to be anymore. They're so out of kilter. We need the science really, and we need that investment in science to protect the asset that is a social, cultural, and economic boom to the region. Well, Mark, governments indicate their priorities by budgets. The federal budget came out last week. Did you see anything in there that made you happy in terms of what Gail was just talking about? Yeah, unfortunately, not really, Steve. Again, uh, when we look at the investments in the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, it's a positive investment. There's going to be a year-over-year -year investment, but the a big part of that is actually paying back a past debt that was owed by Canada because it didn't pay its dues to the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission for over a decade. Uh, so that, that obviously is positive, but it's also not something to pat ourselves on the back about. Um, the Freshwater Action Plan, which sunsetted on uh, March 31st, they've made a one-year investment, 19.6 million for this year, um, but that's going to be spread across eight major water basins in this country, where the Great Lakes is just one of them. So there's actually going to be less money for the Great Lakes, not more than what we've seen under a woefully underfunded freshwater action plan going forward. And, you know, obviously there's a positive investment in the experimental lakes area where we do a lot of freshwater science. And that science is positive. Um, but I think in the aggregate, Steve, Canada needs to be doing a lot, a lot more when it comes to investing in not only restoration in the Great Lakes and Great Lakes science, but protecting its freshwater resources right across this country. And so uh, I was I was really disappointed with the federal budget um, uh, last week, and particularly since it's the 50th anniversary of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, agreement that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau Sr. signed uh, 50 years ago. Can I just follow up with you on one thing there? You said we didn't pay our bills for a decade. How do we get away with not paying a bill that we have promised to pay as it relates to the Great Lakes, which are, never mind, the, you know, all the aesthetic reasons why you'd want to keep that system clean. It's a huge part of our economic future. How exactly do we it get is. away with not paying our bills? Well, it's been a long-standing irritant with the United States and Canada as it relates to the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. It's one of those issues and irritants that doesn't hit prime time. Um, but it's uh, it's there. It's been known. And, um, you know, thankfully, through the last budget, uh, that uh, past mistake has been corrected. Um, and uh, but there are, that's just one of many issues where I think we need to really look at where Canada is in the conversation. And a lot of people think that the United States is falling behind on the environment as it relates to the Great Lakes. Uh, they're well ahead of Canada. Hmm. One of the things that um that we try to do on this program, because I know I hear from people who say, this is all just far too big for me as an individual to have any impact over. So Kelsey, can I bring you in at this point and say, if you're watching this or listening to this right now, and you're one individual who cares about the Great Lakes, what's one thing you could do to do your part? I think the, the biggest answer I have for that question, and I tell my, my students this and, and others that I, that I work with is, restore your connection to water, restore your connection to the Great Lakes. And that often comes from, you know, as small as knowing where your water comes from. Um, what, you know, when you turn on that tap, what, how is it actually getting to you? And what are the implications as well when you have the disbursement of your wastewater? How is that, where is that wastewater going? And how is it implicating the health of the Great Lakes or the potential deterioration of the Great Lakes. And, and I would just say too that every individual has 
a responsibility and a duty of care in terms of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Our nation signed this agreement, uh, both the United States and Canada. And so if you see yourself as a Canadian citizen or a United States citizen, then you have an obligation to see through the fulfillment of this agreement. And you do that through your civic duty of voting, of hosting town halls and asking the hard questions to our leadership that are in government to ask them, you know, where, how are they dedicating resources, as, as Mark mentioned earlier. You also may be asking them about what types of legislation they are putting forward. In 2017, we saw a bill introduced to Parliament, however unsuccessful, that tried to recognize the legal personhood of the Great Lakes. We saw the city of Toledo recognize the legal personhood of Lake Erie in 2019. However, uh, that has been, uh, been tested unsuccessfully in the courts. But we're seeing these types of rights of nature initiatives emerge for the Great Lakes. A bill was just introduced in the New York State legislature by a representative to recognize the inherent legal rights of the Great Lakes. And so I think at an individual scale, we all can become more aware and try and mobilize around these types of innovative legislation that will empower us to protect the beauty, the biodiversity of the Great Lakes that is inherent to our survival in addressing our current climate crisis. Education and engagement, always a good thing. Gail, uh, we've just got a few minutes left here, but maybe you could add something to that list as well. One thing an individual could do. I, I loved Kelsey's answer, by the way. Connect to the water. Where does your water come from? From the tap. How does it get to the tap? I have no idea. Uh, that's a typical answer. But, but know this, know that big industry, the 19th and 20th century insults to the Great Lakes are really controlled heavily controlled and regulated. It is every choice an individual makes to run that tap, the electrical energy that it requires to purify your water. What you pour down your drain gets back into the lakes, which is where you get your drinking water. And that every incremental bit now matters. It's a cumulative effort of every citizen, of every resident of the region, that everybody puts that little bit of poison down the drain. It ends up coming back to us, to the fish, to the wildlife, and to us. So understand that, well, it's, I'm just one person, what can I do? If everybody had that attitude, we'd have mounds of waste everywhere because nobody would manage their waste. People take, try and deal with their waste reduction. Well, talk about water conservation and water protection as a cumulative requirement because the big pipe discharge is not today's issue. Today's issue is what each and every one of us choose to do. So be responsible, be a steward of the region. It, these are glowing gems that can be seen from outer space have that pride in their protection. Mark, one idea from you? Yeah, simple actions really do matter. So in the Great Lakes right now, 80% of the material that's washing up on the Great Lakes shoreline is plastic litter. Uh, you know, there's just people throwing out food and beverage containers or cigarette butts on our beaches, and it's finding our way into our waterways and polluting our water. So um, how do we be better stewards of the environment by just being responsible citizens and, and uh, not throwing away simple consumer products into our environment? Um, you know, if, if pharmaceuticals is another great example. A lot of people just flush them down the drain. And unfortunately, they can't be treated in our wastewater systems and those pharmaceuticals are getting into the Great Lakes. So be a responsible steward and take them back to a pharmacy and have them properly disposed. Those are just two very simple actions that people can take. That is great advice from all three of you. Mark, we've got about a minute left here, and I want to give it to you because the Council of the Great Lakes Region is partnering with us here at TVO to celebrate this 50th anniversary of something that needs a much better acronym, Mark, the Canada-United States Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, or the Kuskluwuka for short. <laughs> Kuskluwuka is, uh, although it ends with aqua, so that's not bad, but um, what, what should our viewers and listeners know about this 50th anniversary that turns you on? Well, I think just to, to highlight, I think some of the issues that, that Gail and Kelsey had raised and I have raised, uh, just our connections to the Great Lakes. Uh, it's the world's largest freshwater system. It's one of the, the largest uh, regional economies in the world. In fact, if this larger region was a country, it'd be the third largest economy in the world behind the United States and China. So I think over our, through our partnership, we want to be able to remind people in Ontario and Canada just how, how, how fortunate we are to be connected to this wonderful natural resource, but also this massive economy and, and really understand the challenges that we're going to be facing over the next 50 years through uh, urbanization and development, more people coming here, 
um, hopefully developing more food uh, for this region by doing that sustainably, thinking about climate change and how climate change is going to impact our our lakes and our systems. And so we really want to create a space where we can have this conversation in this this uh, celebratory year about our relationship with these lakes and uh, how we think about our relationship with the lakes over the next 50 years. Excellent. And we're happy to help you do that. Uh, from left to right on our screens, Kelsey Leonard, Gail Kranzberg, Mark Fisher. Great of all of you to spend some time with us here on TVO tonight and happy anniversary, happy 50th anniversary to the Great Lakes Agreement. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.